you're listening to the Hit or Die podcast with hosts Jake Soldati and Chad Rockford. Hey everybody, welcome to the Hit or Die podcast, episode 42. We're here with Boston Red Sox scout Josh Labandera, uh, hometown boy. Um, finally live, face to face. He uh, was at home last time, but uh, uh, it's great having you on the show again, Lab. Right on, man. Just pumped up to be in the... The room, dude. The, the room. <laughs> you keep seeing um, it. Uh. Yeah, I keep seeing it when I when I scroll through and, and uh, pop your guys' podcast in and some of the some of the studs you guys have had on here. So it's nice to be sitting where some of them have been. Um, real quick, just updating people on the store uh, that ordered stuff. Uh, I talked to the manufacturer today, and stuff is supposed to be getting out this week. So For the first week or both weeks, both everything. So sorry if you've been waiting two weeks. That uh, it sucks. I'm actually in that group. So me too. Um, yeah, we ordered stuff too. Just so you know. Um, so that stuff should be getting out this week, and I'll try to keep you posted if it doesn't. But as told today, it's going out. And then uh, COS. Yeah, Ben Peterson. Perfect game. Your alma mater. Yeah, Ben. Uh, big long levered. Uh... You know, he's a three-sport kid in high school, played water polo, soccer, uh, goalie on both. Um, really loose body, uh, not a lot of now stuff. Um, gets by with, you know, command. He's got three pitches. Uh, not necessarily a guy for us at this point, um, just because, you know, some of the stuff's a little bit short. But definitely it's a guy you keep in your pocket, and he's a go- guy you keep going back in and checking out on. And um, <clears throat> probably one of those guys that would, uh, if still – it was around would be one of those nice little draft and follow guys that, you know, you you take this year and come back and just check on his progress. If he's gotten stronger, if the velocity's ticked up, if his breaking balls, you know, added a little more power and uh, stuff, but yeah, without the draft and follow it, it it makes it tough to, to, you know, definitely that dude has some ability and and it's, you know, a higher ceiling, uh, deeper projection kind of guy, but um you just can't take that dude right at, at this point unless you're patient and you're willing to have an organization that's going to wait and, and develop that that fastball and strength and obviously the secondary. But uh, definitely an interesting one to keep going back on, man. I'm kidding yeah. with some upside. Yeah, probably, pretty cool. Probably a four year guy. Good four year oh, guy. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Good four year guy. What's you know he threw eighty four eighty four pitches, seventy nine fastballs, two sliders, two changeups. That's what I read. Something like that. Some in that, or one something else. Seventy nine fastballs. I mean, I could be, I could be wrong because we've been shut out three games in a row. But <laughs> um, maybe there's a little lack of adjustment. <laughs> there, he's just pinpoint. Well, I don't know. Well, the well, hardest well, fastball to hit is a good located fastball. Yeah, I was just gonna say, what's the best pitch in fastball? You know, well located, or what's the best pitch in baseball? It's yeah. a well located fastball. Um, and, and you know, if you watch this kid pitch, that's what he is, man. Yeah. Fastball command. Uh, both sides of the plate and uh to his credit he's got some deception you now it's a longer levered guy you know ball's getting out there a little bit and uh you know i don't know how, how the ball you know not one to talk about technology but uh from the pitching side i think you know that that spin data is interesting um it, it, it explains why he gets swings and misses uh which you know a normal radar gun necessarily see dude you look at it you're like man it's 86 and then you go back and look at it, and the guy might have some, you know, ridiculous spin rate of twenty six hundred or twenty five hundred or whatnot, um, or whatever it may be. Uh, and you just go with that. And now he projects; he puts on more strength. Hey, maybe, maybe you got something here. But uh, the now stuff's kind of what, what tells the tale, I guess. And you brought up the draft and follow. What? What? What was that? Not, why is it not a thing anymore? I'm, um, just because I don't know. I'm, no, I'm, I actually agree. I wish it. I wish there's still. I've heard be, people talk. Like even Andy's the Juco game that. would be a lot stronger. One hundred percent. I think that's really affected the junior college. Uh, uh, their ability to get those kind of guys um, that have upside to come in that that improves it actually it, it improves the the, the play. Uh, you look at programs, uh, the history of programs, Sac City. I mean, they used to have tons and tons of drafts year in year out. River, uh, Riverside was a powerhouse. Yeah, Riverside, uh, Santa mm-hmm. Ana. Um, in Northern California, Fresno City had guys year in, year out. You know, COS, COS Merced, uh, you know, Laney. She's mm-hmm. looking oh, at yeah. Laney, man. Laney had tons of, of those dudes that were just athletes that maybe weren't as refined, you know, and, and that's 
their, their tool set that they have the tools that you know there's no doubt about it but they just aren't as refined as those kids that are ready to go play at, at division ones and higher levels uh to where you know the whole junior college scheme has changed man it, it's really been hit hard and it's unfortunate those guys used to get to play game after game in the fall i mean Dude, we would play, I want to say, you know, we'd play Tuesday, Thursday, doubleheader Saturday, doubleheader Sunday. So you're getting six games a week, uh, you know, traveling, home games, you know, double dip at Santa, you know, Santa Barbara, come back, go to Cuesta. So you were getting spread around, not just playing the local guys, but you were kind of expanding, you know, especially in the fall, um, just playing the games and, and getting the reps. Uh, and then that's what it's about. And I think junior college, you know, what do they get, 10 contacts now? Yeah, it's, um, it's down to even when I played. Yeah, it's <clears> just, <throat> it, it's no draft and follow has affected the game at that level in, in more ways than one, uh, I, I would have to say. It's funny, they regulate the contacts for high school and all that, and yet, you, I mean, there's travel ball kids are playing up until December. There was travel ball going. I mean, they didn't stop. Like three weeks ago. Yeah. You know, we're worried about pitch count in arms, and yet you've got a, a roster of 13 or 14 kids that play six games in two days. Yeah, and arms go and no ice and no running and no conditioning, and uh, it just gets mishandled. And uh, and I won't say all of them. I don't want to throw all of them and lump them into... Majority. Yeah, I'll but say there's a majority. Yeah. Majority. I see a lot of it mis- mishandled. Oh, yeah. And I've been there. I've coached it way when I first started. I did travel, and I was like, dang, this is borderline dangerous. Well, especially when all they care about is winning. They don't care about the kid itself. Right. It, it, I'm kind. I'm not, I wouldn't say I deal with it. Yeah. You know, I see it right now with, with my son. He's, he's not even nine, you know, and we're, we're doing some tournaments and stuff. And uh, just this, the emphasis of winning, like, oh, we have to win. We have to win. We're, you know, we're, we're this, this team everybody wants to play on. And... Man, at the end of the day, it's about developing. Uh, it's about teaching kids at that age, eight, nine, teach hitters how to hit the ball hard, square the ball up, hit the ball hard. That should be their goal every at bat, whether you get on or get don't get on. Hit the ball hard, square it up. Um, hustle on and off the field. Run balls out. Know, know where to throw the baseball. You know, the basic fundamentals of the game, you know, where the the base the base of the, the, the whole building, you need to build that thing up, and you get to the top, I mean, Man, we're jumping up and going to the elevator, you know, floor 10 with these kids. It's talking to them like they've been playing for five, six years. And you have to teach these little dudes everything. And it's a process, man. And it's patience. And, um, you know, hopefully hopefully, I have the right temperament, you know, with my guy. But, dude, I'm not going to, you know, live or die over a weekend tourney in, in Mendota if we don't win uh, over, you know, 16 teams or whatever. It's about development and uh, just teaching my son how to play the game right, and that's what we should be, te- you know, teaching all these guys at that age. Well, how many uh, besides you? But you're there for your son. How many uh, professional scouts are at that nine year old travel ball game? Zero. Oh, okay. Uh, zero. Uh, I didn't know zero were... college recruiters. Um, <laughs> IMG's not there recruiting. Uh, Boris, I didn't see anybody with Boris there either. Uh, so. You know, there's not a lot of scullies being handed out at 8, 9, 10, 11 year old. Uh, they still got to go to high school and, and get past the challenges of high school that, that aren't just, you know, competition. It's the outside uh, influences that start playing a, playing a, uh, a factor. Um, you know, they play for these travel guys year in, year out. They're doing these tournaments here and there, and uh, it's how good they are, how good they are. Oh, they're hitting 400, 450. Well, I go out and watch high school, and they're not hitting 250. So, um, and supposedly they're facing this great and better, bigger competition. I, I just don't see it. I scout a lot of these tournaments, and it's yeah, there are some good teams. Don't get me wrong, uh, there are some teams that, that are stacked that, that do have some prospects, but the majority of them are not. They're, they're not, and it's not that good. It doesn't matter what what they're wearing. I don't care what jersey. I don't care if it says anything could be any brand any logo any any team that's a special team like it's about how good the player is at the end of the day and that's what the college coaches are recruiting um and and those guys can preach and and, and talk to their blue in the face about how good they put their players are and how they develop and and this and that but at the end of the day it's going to boil down to how good the kid is uh and and you know you're selling your product but you hope that product stands up to what you've been preaching um so it's it's a it's a funky industry. There's a lot of money involved, um, way too much money 
in my opinion. Well, maybe that's Way part of where the, the wanting to win comes from, too. Well, yeah. how can We're you... We're investing dollars. We better... You know, we need to win. But how can you actually say you develop players? Don't. Because you're with them for games, yep. and maybe one, maybe one or two days a week. Yep. Maybe you get these kids to, you know, if it's these big, there's a lot of big name uh, places that, that claim they develop. You know, I don't understand. I hit with a lot of kids that play for these organizations. They're not in the cages flipping to them. Uh, I don't see them hitting them fungo to them out on the weekends at, at their high school ballparks. I see high school coaches doing it. I, I see them developing during high school practice at game at, at their practices when they're getting ground balls and doing repetitions. But I never see travel ball guys hitting actual having workouts hey we're having an infill workout or hey we're having a, a hitter's little camp you know some might do um and, and there might be some that, that hold them on the weekends i'm sure there are uh but if to say that you're a development program I, I, that's a little far-fetched for me um just call it what it is it's travel ball period yeah. travel ball um you know there's no way to sugarcoat it it's travel ball period well and you got guys that period flip <laughs> Right. Period. How many period. It, yeah. see, guys flip <laughs> teams, <laughs> right? It, they don't all stay on one program. Uh, we, you know, we're not playing enough here. We're going no. to take our money elsewhere. And everybody wants to take credit for somebody. You know, you get oh, one yeah. kid that's played for three different teams. Now he's now all of a sudden three different programs have developed him. That makes zero sense to me. I mean, it, yeah, you got to put your everybody's trying to put their stamp and label on everybody. You know, they never repull their tweet after a guy goes off and, and, and struggles at the D1 and kicks back. You know what I mean? <laughs> They're all in prior to, uh, but after after the fact, you know, where, where are they at? So you just got to be careful and, and just know what you're getting into from a from – a, if and, hey, I'm not saying that's the wrong route. You don't do it. There are some events you go to, you know, um, that, that there is colleges. You have to go during the right windows. Uh, attending a tournament in Arizona when not a – any college school can go to is pointless. It's pointless. The money you're paying uh, for all this so-called exposure and experience, save it. Focus on your high school season. It's January 15th, man. You guys are getting ready to go. You can't even be recruited at that time. Exactly. Yeah, we're talking about the window. You we've, know? Yeah, we've talked about that. The recruiting Knowing, calendar. Know the calendar. Go like, help your high school program get better. Go go, go help your team win a Valley title, hopefully. you know. Uh, focus on your high school season. I, I'm still waiting for them to announce what travel team a guy plays for when he goes to the big leagues on TV. I never hear it. <laughs> they always tell you what high school he went to and what former players went there. Um, but they never talk, oh, this guy played for uh, such and such travel organization. They don't, it, it, it's point. It doesn't matter. Uh, they talk about your high school. Be proud of what high school and city you're from. I mean, at least that's how I grew up. We didn't have travel ball. We had Babe Ruth, um, you know, Little League. That, you, rep you represented your city. It, yeah. it was about that. It was about your high school. You were pumped up, you know. Hey, man, I was pumped up to wear my, my Menachi gear out, even though people would laugh, you know, Porterville or whatnot. Granted, we have some pretty good players that come out of there. Uh, back in the day, but um, you know that's what it was about. That's what you played for. You played for for where you're from, man. It wasn't about this organization or or you're playing for some travel guru. Um, it was about you know the high school, the program, where you're from, man. That's that's kind of how I grew up. The travel guru, mm -hmm. yeah, guru. That word's thrown around a lot. <laughs> in the guru. <laughs> There's been some good Twitter beef with uh, some of the hitting guys. Like, uh, was it Swingman or Swingman and and Mark Kevin Hake? Uh, and, yeah, yeah, Euclid and, and Franzen. Franzen. And Franzen was on that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, man, don't get me going on today, man. <laughs> You've got a guy that has not had one at bat in his life, and, and I don't even know what level of baseball he's played. But it's not even near the level of baseball that you're talking to two former players that were self-made players. They weren't tooled out individuals. Euclid, I want to say both Euke and Franny were ninth, tenth round picks around there. At the Jeez, dude, they're not going to have to work the rest of their life because they're going to be on MLB pension because they were able to go up there and, and make the most of their ability. Uh, you know, and I don't know if Franny was an all-star, but I want to say I think you made the all-star team a couple years. You know, he was a fixture in that Boston lineup. Um, and that guy knew how to hit, man. Um, to talk to a dude about launch angles, it's all this data guy. I mean, they actually named Sabermetrics after Euclid yeah. with his walks. Yeah, he knew how to get on base. Yeah, the, the on base percentage. And, you know, um, but those guys, they need to just understand what lane they're in, man. Teach your stuff. Do your thing. You spit some guys out, great. But you're not the guys in the box hitting the baseball, man. And at the end of the day, dude, have some respect. 
<laughs> just have some yeah. respect. You know, have some respect for yeah, guys. It's that, okay to have a little difference of opinion. Yeah. Right? But you're not the end all be there is no end all be all. No. There's so many different ways to do things. I mean, you think about it, yeah, the, I, I want to say there are some absolutes to hitting. You know, certain things have to happen, and, and the barrel has to go certain ways and finish, and uh, you got to get to it direct. All those, you know, there are some things that have to happen, but gosh, I played with God, Tony Bautista, man. The way he started, he started with the bat open, the big open stance, but by the time that pitcher came, he was in a good, you know, strong hitting position. So, you know, there's, God, look at what Juan Gonzalez uh julio franco had that mm-hmm. barrel pointed straight back at the pitcher uh, and then all of a sudden he rocks it back but you know there's many different ways to do things it boils down to the athlete hand-eye coordination uh, and his ability to put the barrel on the baseball yeah i just yeah <laughs> let's talk I mean, I mean it's just funny like euclid and france and and i was with the giants when france was with them and here's a guy that had to grind 100%. every single day to stay in the big leagues so you don't think he had to get his swing, right? You know what I mean? And even Euclid, everybody looked at him and looked, what is this guy doing? He can't yes. hit. You Hands know? separate and had the little yeah. rock up top. And then, you his know, feet like one inch self-made apart. players. Yeah. Self-made players. Uh, so it's like, who are you? Like you said, some guy that probably mm-hmm. never even swung a bat before talking to these guys that had to make it. Like, actually make it, make it. They weren't just first-round bonus guys that were like, no. oh, they're going to get a shot no matter what. They had to hit. Yeah. They, they had to hit. They had to hit. They, You're right. They, not in this, you know, let's let's change. Let's, they, they, if anybody wants to change anything, let's change what they're calling themselves, hitting consultants. You're not teaching hitting. No. You want to talk, hey, you want to call yourself a slugging consultant, a slow-pitch softball consultant? Sweet. Cool. You're a slugging consultant because a hitting consultant is going to teach you how to hit that pitch down and away and drive it to the right center field not try to lift it out of the ballpark a hitting guy is going to teach you how to get the barrel to the baseball efficiently short and use the whole field from pole to pole and be able to hit the ball on a line you know not sit back and swing and miss swing and miss and then oh we catch one dude that's not hitting no that's slugging and that's swinging out your ass what can i say that swing- say whatever you want okay, so that's yep. swinging out your ass that's not hitting dude um when talk hitting talk about guys like Edgar Martinez, Manny Ramirez. The dudes knew how to hit, okay? And the power came with the hitting because they knew what to do, knew how to manipulate their swings, how to get to certain pitches, what they were looking for in their approaches. You know, everybody talks about swings. Nobody talks about approach. You know, um, God, you guys got me all fired up now. Brent, good. But look, half of being a good hitter is knowing who you are. If you're 140 pounds and you're in the launch angle lane, dude, your, your career is going to be short. You know, know who you are. If you're a big, strong, physical cat, hey, man, yeah, let's work on barreling it up. And as we learn how to hit, now let's start tapping into that power. Hey, guess what, dude? We're getting really good to right center. Let's let's see. Hey, get a little bit more separation on the front side. Let's get a little bit more angle. You're, you're, you're understanding how to hit, uh, and that's progressing to the power. Not just, hey, we're going to do this move, magical moves, and – Hit homers. Dude, it doesn't work that way, man. Everybody's bodies are geared different. Everybody has different lever, levers, different strengths. Uh, some guys have hand strength. Some guys have the physical strength to sit back and do that. If you're a short dude that can run, get on base, man. Let the big bopper drive you in. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating to, you know, <clears throat> doing what I do than just going watching guys not understand who they are. Uh, you know, and that's hard to do as a player. Um, and, and I'll be the first to tell you, I mean, I had some home runs at Fresno State. That gave me the idea that I had power. That was the last thing I should have been thinking about, you know, and, and that's what got me in trouble later on in the career. You know, you start trying to change gears and hit for power, and next thing you know, you start sacrificing things, uh, something that you were really good at prior to. Um, so, you know, being a getting all that power and stuff, it comes, man, and it comes with strength and it comes with age. Uh, but primarily, these guys got to know who they're working with and, and what they're what what they're what piece of clay they're playing with, man? How much mass is there? How much strength? You know, can't keep. Dude, I keep watching dudes teach pot flies all day long. I mean, we have some really good outfielders running around here before long. <laughs> I mean, gosh, we already got two really good ones over there at Buchanan and Memorial. So, uh, gosh, they're going to be busy this spring. I'll tell you that. But we were um, talking the other night, and you were telling me about like when you went to St. Francis and you went to De La Salle and, and some of the guys here and. It all got back to, well, this, you know, they're going to have to be consistent offensively and they're going to have to, you know, less swing and miss. And, and it all came back to, you know, hitting an offense and scoring runs. 
And I was like, that's kind of funny that you say that because all these guys have hitting coaches. Yeah. But yet, uh, all their teams are going to come down to how well they do offensively. And so far, it's been hit and miss. More miss, maybe. Yeah, it's early in the season, too. I, I You know, the pitching's going to be ahead of the hitters early on. Um, that's just kind of history of the mm-hmm. game. Um, you'll you'll start seeing, you know, as the hitters start warming up, these pitchers' arms are going to start warming up, too. You know, we're going to get in the middle of the year, and the Aeon kid's going to be buzzing 94, 95, and uh, Riley Cooper's fastball is going to tick up. Um, so the hitters, as they get warmed up, yes, the pitchers are going to start getting warmed up, too. But, uh, you know, it's going to take a few games for these guys. But at the end of the day, man, you got to hit to win, um, especially in high school because, dude, you're going to run into a buzzsaw. Uh, and all it takes is one good arm, man. One good arm. And, and the way the, the elimination process is around here, and you get uh, in that single elimination, man, you know, you start looking around. Who's got two good arms on the high school scene? North. Frontier's got a couple good arms that can check. Clovis West has a couple yeah. arms. Buchanan's got the big boy A on they. They're going to win the majority of the games. That kid's on the mound, I mm-hmm. promise you. Um, you know, so, yeah, how good is your starting pitching yeah. now? And then. How how good are you executing on offense? You know, the timely hits, the two two out hitting, the two out hitting runners in scoring position, man. Who gets the most of those? Um two strike hitting. Yeah, two strike hitting, the clutch hitting late in the game, you know, who's who's battle driven, who's who's put in the the, the tough practice hours, the, the tough scrimmages, the, the the long days, you know, when you get down to the end of the season, who's conditioned good? You know, whose arm's gonna hey, whose arm's gonna Yeah, who's gonna get be, tired? Yeah, who's gonna be tired? You know, there's going to be a couple arms that have some heavy workloads that are going to get a little fatigued by the end of the year. You know, you got to look at that. That starts playing a factor, you know, and you got to map your way out. I mean, I've never been a head coach, dude, but hey, man, it is, it's tough, Uh, you know, but man, it's a competitive league around here. It really is. Anywhere you go, uh, you get up in the the Bay Area with with Sarah and uh, Archbishop Mitty's got a good club. you mentioned St. Francis. They've they've got a really good club. Vacaville's got a has a good club. You know, a lot of people saw Turlock come down here. Um, Turlock's a good team. They've got a couple high end players. You know, first round potential, first round hitting. You know, catcher um, and a couple good arms. Uh, there's some good high school teams all over this year. Uh, you know, you get up in Sacramento. Oakmont's got a kid that's going to be buzzing, possibly a hundred. Um, there's, you know, Granite Bay's got a kid, 93, 95 Jesuits got a couple arms, you know, really good underclassmen and a big right hander. So, um, this is a really good high school class that, that I'm, that I have an opportunity to scout this spring. Um, Mike, super good high school class. Uh Oh, is that your boy? Uh, we'll talk to him later. (laughs) We were talking how, cause high school teams do normally have a hating coach on their high school team. 100%. So how much do you think it affects the high school team when you have a high school hitting coach and then you have all these guys, not saying every single one, but a majority of guys, te- typically your good players normally have hitting coaches or somebody they go to or travel ball coaches they go to. How do you think that affects the dynamic of a hitting a high school hitting coach trying to get the team to buy into an approach. It's plan. hard. I mean, they better perform. <clears throat> Otherwise, there's going to be friction the whole time. Like, you know, because everybody has different thoughts and philosophies. And um, if you can manage it and get on the same page, I, I think it both sides benefit um, because now you're getting a little bit of information from both ways that, that, you know, you take what's good and you take what maybe doesn't apply to you, but man, you got to be honest as a hitter. You know, our, our hitting guy talked to us when we went back to our, our meetings about, you know, our big league guys and, um, you know, the, the self-conscious guy or, or the, you know, you got the self-awareness guy, that the guy that's cool with everything. The guy that's self-conscious is always worried about everybody else. Um, so it, it's, it's just about getting on the same page. I think it, it does cause some friction because now, everybody's got to be pulling the same direction, man. You know, so if you're trying to teach a guy how to drive the ball the other way, but he's going to sit and talk to a guy that is teaching him how to sit and spin, um, it's going to butt heads, man. Um, Who's wrong? Who's right? You know, it goes back to like approach. Hey, man, if I'm getting pitched 85% of the time on the outside part of the plate, why am I going to look for 15% of pitches that I'm not going to get? 
You know, it's pointless. Like, go to a high school game, watch, actually go scout and watch a high school game. Unless the kid's got a little fuzz on the, on the bump, they're not throwing on the inner third. They're not throwing on the inner third. Hitters end up getting themselves out more times than not in high school with that rollover 6-3, rollover 5-3, rollover, 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 trying to pull outside pitches. Breaking balls. Typically, how many right-handed Pitchers are high school, you know, right-handed high school pitchers, breaking balls away to right-handers. Balls, everything's going the other way from right-handed hitters, man. I've been there constantly trying to pull, constantly trying to pull. So, hey, man, dude, you're constantly going to be button heads, in my opinion. And we've also talked with, uh, you know, we both are in the hitting game pretty good. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of these hitting coaches and travel coaches are, you know, you're paying them a lot of money. How truthful are they actually being to their hitters? Because me and you, the money's not the issue. We're not worried about getting money for a lesson. We'll give free lessons if we have to, just to try to get somebody better. And we try to be truthful with them. And we're not afraid that tell, tell somebody the truth. And if they want to go somewhere else, they want to go somewhere else. But a lot of these hitting coaches out there, I feel like they're not being truthful, you know, with their hitters. And, um, you know, they're more worried about, how it looks on the outcome rather than how the hitter, you know, looks. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that kind of man? Like, I don't know. I like, I lo- I love getting lessons. I like working with kids and I, I don't work with the, I don't open myself up to work with, with this mass majority. It's not about numbers to me. Um, you know, like picking out a few kids that, that to me, man, is I like working with kids that want to be good <clears throat> kids that want to learn. Kids that that want to be that want to separate themselves from from other players, I guess. Not to say like, oh my gosh, I'm this great hitting coach, but um, I, I just think I, I like working with guys that, that have that have that kind of mindset that I might have had at that age. Um, I didn't have that opportunity. No, I didn't get hitting lessons growing up, dude. Like my dad, dude. I grew up on a dairy man. I grew up through rocks and hit them with a, one of those yellow wiffle bats, bro, and. I'd piss the milker off because I'd throw the ball off the barn all day long. Filled in, you know, I, I, I used to fill balls off this this pavement crap. But I was like Dominican infields. So, hey, man, maybe that's, that might have helped the hands a little bit. But, no, um, <clears throat> you know, going back to uh, the lessons, like, you know, I, I, I want to provide them something. When they leave, that, that they got something out of it, whether it's we talk about approach or, hey, man, we, we, we might have fixed a little a load issue that they might have with their hands or it's just about seeing kids progress and get better and, and excel at, at a sport that I love. You know, it's, it's nice to be able to help, help a guy reach that, that, that ability or, uh, have a, had a couple of kids in that past. And it's like, man, I'm not going to go online and tweet about kids I've worked with. Like you look, man, we can show these kids something. We are not the reason why they are good. They are good because they go out and they put hours in the cage. They practice, they work at their craft. And, and for us to sit around and tweet and, and blow our ourselves up and pat ourselves on the back hey look at my guy look at my guy it's not about that man like dude you should have enough self-confidence to not have to do that kind of crap like oh well, you got to go on and tweet about how good you are look at me look at what i did with this kid no hey man you showed him some things he bought into a couple nuggets and he's applying and it's working for him dude hey kudos to the kid man yeah. kudos to the kid not you not you johnny hitting coach or billy hitting whatever whoever you are like just hey man, give let's start giving these kids some credit for the work they're putting in. You know, it's if I gotta read another I'm blessed to announce thing, I mean I think it's great for these kids and cool, but at the end of the day, like, come on, man, like, dude, you're going to South Dakota State Emperors. Awesome. Awesome. The whole world doesn't need to know. Cool. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of that stuff. Like that's a, I'm, not a, guys are I'm not a taster it. guy. I don't like guys that are tasters, like tasting themselves, man. Like, dude, get over it. Constantly retweeting about themselves. Dude, turn the page. Let's go. Does it make the job hard sometimes? Because you have to go look at certain guys and it definitely guys are doing can become that. a turn off. It, it really can, man. It, it can, especially if they're tweeting but about They could be warning signs, right? Yeah. I mean, we're looking for substance guys. People forget that. When we go out and scout, we're not looking for guys to play pro ball. We're looking for big leaguers, dude. We're looking for guys that act like big leaguers, carry themselves like big leaguers, train like big leaguers, think like big leaguers. Not guys that are carried about the the, the fluff, the social, the, the 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 spotlight stuff. We care. We want guys that have substance, like ball players, gritty, tough, 
you know, the professionals, Derek Jeter's man. You think Derek Jeter runs around? He, that guy didn't run around. <laughs> no, like, he never saw anything. You know, we're look, no, no, you know, still don't. No, no. I mean, those look, guys with exceptional makeup, man. They're not tweeting, retweeting like stupid crap or. Uh, yeah, they, kids just don't understand that, man. They're, they're being followed and watched 24-7, 24-7. One retweet just might sour somebody's taste, man. And well, a lot of them want, you know, they want to be Everybody followed, wants the blue check mark, man. And they want to they wanna be seen, too. Everybody wants the blue check mark. Everybody wants that fame. It's, you know, we want to microwave our way to, to stardom. Let's, let's nuke it, man. That's what we're trying to do with these players, too. These guys are... Look at the velocity, man. We're trying to definitely microwave velocity. Yeah. Uh, these throwing programs and guys are sprinting and throwing as hard as they can. Like somebody's going to get keep. Guys are going to keep blowing out, man. Uh, and TJ and guys are no. I mean, what are we going to talk about? The guys getting moved up a year or two or holding themselves back a year to be a year older. I mean, that was next on my yeah, list. You know, we can get because this is that was a new thing. I hadn't heard. I mean, honestly, I'm and it would no, bubble, it's been going on. We're going to bubble out here, was, right? We don't, around. we don't. We deal with transfers, like yeah. kids leaving. Yeah, and but, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. No, but See, and kids don't know that's a turn off to us too. We don't want some dudes that's transferred two or three, four different schools. That that's a little nerve wracking. Like, why is there? Why do you keep transferring? What is wrong where you're at that you got to keep transferring? Yeah. Or, you know, getting into the, you know, nineteen year old senior. It's it's a turn off for us as well from a pro game. Yeah, like, that's the first I'd heard of, of that going on, and 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 then apparently it's been a thing. Yeah, like we said, seventeen year old senior, nineteen year old senior, the both same tools, exactly the same, same tools. Who you drafted? Seventeen year old all day long. Yeah, I mean. More upside, youthful, uh, you know, granted, depending on the body and how it looks and stuff. I mean, if the 19-year-old still has some projection left, hey, why not? But, man, we're obviously looking for the younger cast. Just look at all the Latin kids we signed. The international market, it's all young, young kids. Um, so the younger, the better, honestly, for us. Um, I get it from a college pr- perspective. Yeah, hey, you're getting that extra year of maturity, um, physicality. That's great. Uh, you are draft eligible as a sophomore, which hey, that's you're not skipping a beat there uh, per se. Hey, uh, well, Quentin Selma was is older. He he was draft eligible as a sophomore. And we've had multiple kids that were, um, but at 19 year old senior, dude, you better. When I show up to the park, dude, you need to dominate. Like you need to hit, like and hit, and thump. Uh, and if you're a pitcher, you better have some stuff, man. Like I'm, it'd be hard to show up for 86, 88 if you're 19, dude. Like. I get it if you're 17, but 19, uh, you know, from a college stand- standpoint, yeah, you know, obviously it's going to help with the maturity. Just the kid's going to be older, um, have a little wiser head on his shoulders. But um, from a professional standpoint, I mean, I would kind of discourage that. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get the concept of it. Is is it to <clears throat> help their high school team win? I don't understand. What's, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't What's the point? You're I, staying I an know. extra year to help your – High school cl- club or well, like you said, you, you, Maybe be, you put up more numbers and you get you're a, technically an offer. A freshman in college plays senior year of high school. Yeah, you're yeah, like a freshman so. playing. It's uh, you know, it's like uh, we get the the D one kickbacks to the JUCOs. Those are kind of turnoffs too. I mean, why couldn't you play at the D one? You know, I mean, but nobody ever asked that question. It's like all of a sudden a guy goes back to junior college and he's a prospect all of a sudden. How so? You know, I get it from a, hey, pitchers are totally different animals. Uh, But a position player, if you're at a D1 and you're kicking back, that's kind of a red flag. It it, it is. Um, You know, granted, there are some, there are the rare occasions where it is a conflict of interest between player coach. But 95% of the time, you just weren't ready. One, you weren't ready for that level and, and Dude, couldn't pro- handle. Yeah, you just weren't ready for that level. Uh, not to say you're not good enough yet, um, but maybe that might have been a little bigger jump than the ability was yeah. was ready for. Um, but um, you know, but being a 19 year old senior dude, like you better really do something when a pro guy shows up to the park. Uh, you know, um, not a big fan of transfers and kickbacks, and it, it's hard when you get into our game. Um, with the pro side, a little different from the college. Hey man, it's college. It's different. We're not giving. They're not giving them two million bucks or eight hundred grand. Right. I mean, I got a report. I got four million dollars on a eighteen year old high school kid, dude. You know, um, people don't understand that man. That's a lot of money. You're banking that that guy becomes the Mike Trout or 
uh, 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 Carlos Correa. You know, Mookie Betts was a fifth rounder, dude. Like, to get Mookie Betts in the fifth round is an unbelievable pick. Paul Goldschmidt, like, ninth rounder. Like, I mean, come on, man. Those are the dudes that you, as a scout, those are the guys you make your name on. It's not the first rounder. It's the... Yeah, because everybody's going after those guys. Yes. They're all competing for the same crop. Yes. It's that later round. The Doug Fister, fifth round. You know, guy pitching the big leagues, eight, what, 10 years? 10, 11 years. You yeah. know, um, those are the dudes that, that, that an area scout will get some kudos for, get some love. Kind of what's your checklist? You don't have to give us the, you know, your, your details, not the super inside info, but like when you get to a ballpark, what's the first thing that you're looking for when you're, you know, you see, you know, you're going to see a couple kids? Let's do high school. Yeah. Can high you, school games, yeah. High school is a little different. Um, I mean, leave early. I mean, you got to get there early. Uh, sometimes that GPS can, can get you a little uh, whacked out and end up in some uh, unfamiliar and uh, not so friendly territories. Uh, up there, you get in some, some regions. Uh, but try to leave early, man. Get to the park early, get some familiarity with it. Like, I try to, like, I don't like to be seen so much all the time um if i gotta watch a pitcher it's one thing because you gotta get behind the dish but if i'm watching a position player man i I typically don't like sitting in the stands i like to get down the line um occasionally i'll just go out behind center field and i'll watch from right behind shortstop man um watch him hit um and I, I, i like to maneuver my way around the yard man i like to see who gets there early um if there's anybody in the cages if maybe a kid might be getting some early work around balls um See if my prospect shows up early, or if he, or if he's the guy running in two minutes before a stretch, putting his spikes on with half his jersey hanging out, you know, hat on crooked. Like that's not something a, <laughs> that Tom Kochman's going to like in a ball. Um, so you know, you, you try to get there early, um, watch them go through a, a routine if they have one. It, it's nice to see high school players have a routine. Um, whether it's, you know, it might be how they put their shoes on and go out and they do certain stretches. They do their little warm ups, you know, watch them go through a, a routine um, and just kind of watch them kind of prepare, see how they interact with their teammates, um, coaches, uh, see if they're, you know, maybe if I catch him on the road, see if he's trying to see anything about the ballpark that might be different um, that, that might affect where he plays. Maybe it's a shortstop with limited foul territory down the third baseline, you know, walk it off, see how many steps he has or whatnot. Or if it's a catcher, kind of throw a couple balls off the backstop, see what kind of bounce he's going to get. Just look for little things that might separate a player from the other guys, you know. And uh, a lot of times, dude, it, when you get into double A, man, everybody has those tools. Everybody does, but it's those little separators, those little things that puts Chad over Jake. You know what I mean? Like, in a it, majority of the time, it boils back down to makeup, man. Like, who's willing to go the extra mile? Who, who's willing to put it in, or or who's willing to get there and prepare? You know, who's willing to take that extra step and you get there a half hour early instead of you know ten minutes before stretch? So, you know, looking for little things a guy might do that stand out, separate himself. And then obviously the games take care of itself. Uh, and I'm not a performance guy, dude. Like, man, they had a kid down at Bakersfield a couple of years ago. I love this kid. Uh, I had a little King Griffey Jr. He's at Cal State now. He's a freshman kid named Jason Roberson, having a good little good little start to his freshman year. Um, but man, I saw that kid three times, dude, and I stuffed him. He didn't get one hit. And the three times I saw him, he was 0 for 11, and I stuffed him. I put 800 grand on him. Like, why? Because he didn't have to perform. The tools are there. The tools are there that, that fit that category to profile there. And, you know, and um, guys don't have to perform all the time. You know, um, it's nice to go to the yard and see a dude you're watching as a hitter, especially if you got your boss with you, get a couple knocks and smoke a couple balls. Or if it's a pitcher, you know, light the gun up a little bit, flash you a breaking ball that's got some bite, you know, maybe sell the change that, that gives him something to say, ooh, this guy, hey, man, I get what Labby's talking about. Um, but sometimes, man, you just go in and, and guys have a look. Guys have a, a presence. Um, a way they carry themselves, the way they look at you, the way they shake their your hands. Sometimes you're like, dude, this guy's a dude. Like Nick Madrigal is like that. Like you'll watch, he'll be debuting. Like if guys, you know, going back to the hitting coaches and stuff. If guys want to be hitters, dude, to tail yourself in high school, be like Nick Madrigal. Be Nick Madrigal in high school. And I can't talk about this dude yet, but I will one day. Um, but be Nick Madrigal. That dude was a stud high school hitter. He didn't hit a lot of home runs, but that dude barreled up things. 
everybody just barrel, barrel, barrel. Like, be Nick Madrigal, man. Wear out the middle of the diamond. Just create havoc. Put the ball in play. You know, those are the kind of dudes like you should tell yourself, tail your, tailor your game after. Um, not like some dude that's pitting 45 pumps in the big leagues and you have one career home run. I mean, <laughs> that's just not realistic, dude. Not, I hear Be you. realistic with who you are, but... Uh, well, you know, he's he's done well in college. He did well at mm-hmm. Oregon State. His, and, in Pro Bowl last year, didn't he strike out less than 10 yeah, times? Yeah, and he had yeah, a great... guy struck out, I think. He had <clears> three or four. 600 at bats. I mean, we can look it up, but I think he struck out 15 times in 500 at bats. It was like some absurd... Stupid. Absurd... Tony Gwynn type rate. Stuff. Yeah, and... Um, dude, I remember him answering the door for me one day, <laughs> dude. And I, I just like, I just like folded because he was standing there. This guy was a rail, like maybe 150 pounds, dude, wet. And he had this little dry fit on it. it had to, it was probably a medium. It looked like an extra large just draped on him. And I'm like, dude, I have, I have, I have way too much money on this little guy. Like, I, I just couldn't get over how tiny he was. But then you go and watch him and you're like, Dude, this guy is a stud. Plays 6'2", yeah. 215 you pounds. Know, if, if that dude's six foot one, he's the first pick. Like, slam dunk, D Brown, boom, slam at home. First pick if he's 6'1". It's just unfortunate. It's unfortunate our game. We do that at times. But um, that guy was almost a red stock, and you can sit around and talk about almost and shoulda, coulda, woulda. But that guy was almost my first pick, my first sign. Uh, but, you know, it boils back down to... These kids, you get the signability, man, and um, you start finding out who really wants to go out and play right away. Um, you know, taking Carson last year, that you know that that was a kid that wanted to go out and play, um, and that was a it was even pretty special. You know, it's Billy's son. Uh, you know, you know the bloodlines are there, the genes are there, and you talk about a guy that had like the intangible things. That was one of the things that that really attracted me to him was. Was dude the guy was on? He was on top of what he wanted to do. He 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 knew what direction he wanted to go in. And he put in the work. Um, you know, instinctive player. The kid grew up at the ballpark. Man, yeah. he sees the game through different eyeballs. You, you know, we have Darren Baker this year at Cal. The kid, you know, and I, I talked about him in high school and when I turned in out of high school. But it's like you got a dude that grew up in the clubhouse. You know, Barry Bonds, Kenny Lofton. I mean, he's Kenny Lofton's bat boy. Um, you know, back in the day. And he's learning how to steal bases from Vince Coleman. You know, he's taking ground balls at second base with, uh, God, who was the national second baseman? He sits around and texts Joey Votto back and forth about hitting. I mean, this dude has a mind that is so much further advanced than other players. And you wonder why there's so many big leaguers kids that get back to the big leagues and are usually better players than their daddies. Um because they get they're learning at a young age. They they see how the professionals go about it and they see what works and uh they learn. They they have that aptitude that, that separate them. And and Carson was one of those kids and a lot of guys I felt like he flew a little bit under the radar with his shoulder or well, excuse me, with his elbow. Um and, and fortunate for me, guys a lot of guys didn't get to see him and you get in the scouting game and it, it's hard, man. You wanna run around and, and especially a kid like him because you like the kid, you wanna tell other guys, Hey dude, you gotta go see this dude, but you gotta be selfish and be like, Hey man, I think I got a dude here. You know, I'm not gonna tell nobody because this is the kind of guy that, that you look for. This is the kind of guy as a scout you're salivating, going, Man, this guy, if he turns out and blossoms into what I think I can be, hey, this is a pretty good pick for where we can get him. And you know, that that's what our game is about. And um sometimes I gotta play that play the jerk, um, and maybe not like a guy that, that a lot of local guys like and uh some guys don't understand that Man, I, I got to find players that can play for the Boston Red Sox um, in the American League East, which is a very competitive <laughs> uh, division. Um, you know, and that 90-mile-an-hour fastball down the road and the local kid has that might touch 93, 94, just you know, might not be enough for us, um, and, and I might have to pass. It's not that I don't like the kid, respect him. Uh, but he just not, might not be for us. And who's to say I'm right, dude? And I promise plenty of people are going to tell me wrong that I'm wrong around here. Uh, but, um, hey, man, I'm wrong every day, dude. I got to go out and, and, and trust my instincts, my eyes, and, and, and what I've seen in the game. And sometimes that's not an easy thing to do. And I, I think we get put, we, you know, scouting per, particular, it, it's a tough job, man. And people think it's fun, and it is fun. Uh, but, dude, we're... 
you know, we're, we're dream givers and you're gone a lot, man. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're not home a lot. I'm, uh, I'm on, we I'm, talk a lot while you're on the road, dude. And it's like, this guy's never home. No, it's, you know, it's, it's tough. Uh, cause you know, you got a family and my wife, she's, she's phenomenal. She does a lot and takes care of the kids and, uh, gets them where they need to go and got, got to be lucky to have her. But, uh, it, it's one of those lives, man. I mean, I spent a lot of times behind the, behind the, behind the steering wheel, uh, staring at the windshield and scrolling through the phone and, and calling some dudes and catching up. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time catching up with guys. Just, you know, it's nice to have guys in different areas and, and find out what's going on around there. Uh, that's part of scouting, man, is having good, good, relationships. good relationships and connections. Like, you know, I have Bakersfield. I can't get to Bakersfield all the time, but you know, I got a couple dudes down there that I trust that 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 see the colleges, that, that see the high schools, and you know, they keep me up to date. And, hey, man, you might want to get back down here to see this kid. Balls come out of his hand pretty good. Hey, I'll buzz back down and lay by, you know, throw the pipe on him and 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 see what he's got and if he's a guy i like to turn in i'll flip him in and, and move on um you know you try not to spend too much time in one area uh might give up who you really like and you know there's a lot of players out there man they're you know and that's why junior college is such a, a great place for some of those guys rather than going to off to these 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 smaller schools you know and the guy want to go to d2 or d3 that's cool but honestly that tells me he doesn't want to be a big leaguer i mean it really does it, like nothing against some of the local schools, but dude, there's not a lot of those guys when they're announcing in the big leagues that came from D two and AIA D threes, uh, any, you know, D fours. There's just not, uh, you know, I got to scout the, the places where they're at. And when a kid's more willing and, and really pumped up to go to one of those places, it, I don't know, man, it kind of red flag for me again, too. Uh, cause if you're a dude that wants to play bro ball, you're going to go to Juco for two years, man. You're going to give me, Two opportunities, two more years to come watch you play. And maybe after your sophomore year, you've put on a few more pounds. Maybe you've taken enough ground balls in the six hole that arm started to get strong enough to where I, we can send you out as a shortstop. Um, you know, junior college is such a great place for these dudes. And, and I don't know why it's become such a bad stigma. It's, it's like a, a slap in the face to go to junior college. It, it's we're better crazy. Than, you know, we're better than junior college. But you look at it, but they would rather go to a small school and, write, and set the bench and sit behind some junior that came from a junior college, by the way, that's starting over them. You know, I, it blows my mind. Um, those schools are going to be there with open arms, pumped up. They're they're giving you school money to come there if you've gone to junior college for two years and proven yourself. Not to mention the Division ones. Uh, it might not be a California D1. Those Northeast schools are always looking for yeah. California junior college players. Um, the Southeast uh, Santa Rosa is always sending dudes out. Delta City, COS, Reedley sending guys. I mean, dude, if you want it, if and if you really want to be a D one player, then you challenge yourself. You go to you go to JC. You know, you, you don't just oh just go to the easy little, you know. For the lights just went out. That was pretty cool. <laughs> That's only happened one other time. Where is it at? But I love it. It's the, right there above the door. Oh, the, I, the board have to get looks like a it. disco light, dude. Um, <laughs> It's sweet. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it's so hard. Like I said, man, it goes back to these dudes want to micro, they want to microwave themselves to, 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 to the level that they think they're at, man, rather than go out and, and grind it out, you know? Um, and I'll be the first to tell you, dude, I was a Juco product. You were a Juco product. Uh, if I had not gone to COS, I promise you. If you I'd told gone, us that. Dude, if I'd have gone straight to Fresno State, I would not have lost it. Uh, junior college was the best move and and for 95 percent of these kids it's the best move but you know dylan, what dylan said the same thing dylan lee 100 percent, man he wasn't ready to go to straight to school uh straight to a four-year you know the breaking ball needed to get a little bit better and he needed a mature i think connor mentioned the same thing and all those i guys. mean it's it's funny that we talk about it when this whole everybody's d1 or bust nowadays oh, but then crazy. they don't get the d1 now they're going to a D2 or D3. Yeah. So if you're D1 or bust, to me, that's yes. that's how we were. We were D1 or bust technically, but our way to get to a D1 went through COS and Fresno City College. What I because love I wasn't going to settle for anything less until that was my last option. Absolutely. I love what uh, Solberg said, too, regarding just you know the price of going to JUCO as a scholarship. Mm -hmm. you yeah. know, I thought that made great sense. I never looked at it that way. 
And it's so true. Because your first two years, you're doing your GED anyways, yeah. no matter where you go. Well, go back and look at it. So most of it, if you if, if want to get back to like and say, okay, this is probably the reason why is you look at all these people, they do all this travel ball. These kids are, they're pumping money mm-hmm. into this travel, pump, pump, pump. Well, that's the only thing that comes about it. So now we've just spent $10,000, $12,000 this summer on little Mikey to travel around so he could get a scholarship. Well, he doesn't get one. So or he does to like all of a sudden, yes, yeah. here comes the travel ball guy. Oh, I found your kid a home, a great fit. It's a great fit for him. Yeah, because there it's not the skill level that you know, and that's why he fits there. Just go to the junior college. Go for two years, but now it's like, oh man, we just wasted all that money this summer. So they jump on this this four year school like it's the fit, like that's where it's supposed to be. And it's probably the only school that's ever recruited him. So now they're even a little bit happier. Uh, they get a little warm and fuzzy, and now they commit. And, man, at the end of the day, they look at that junior college, and, dude, they're going to save money. They're going to play more innings. They're going to have a lot better opportunity to get on the field right away. Um, and and around here, dude, we have – kids are driving past local JUCOs to go to these these smaller schools that have reputable coaches with long standing resumes to go to these smaller schools. It just blows my mind, man. It, it really does, you know. Well, if you throw that process back, right, you start at 9, 10 years old until you're 18. How much money in the eight years do you spend on travel ball, lessons, you, tons? And then, oh, I didn't get a scholarship. Now I got to fork out twenty five grand. Or you don't get a full ride scholarship, and everybody thinks they're getting this full ride. Well, hey, it costs sixty grand to go to Santa Clara, so I get twenty five percent. So I'm getting fifteen, right? I think I did the math. <laughs> I still got to come up with twenty five twenty five grand to go to Santa Clara, but I'm on scholarship. Not to mention the money I dropped in the process to get the mm-hmm. scholarship, which I probably would have gotten the offer anyways had I not done the twelve thousand dollars scholarship because I have the ability. Um, so it just, man, it's, it's kind of vicious little circle, uh, and everybody gets caught up in this game, man. And it's, it's game and it's just garbage that comes out of these dudes mouths, man. And it, it, it's, it's unfortunate because the long list and and of emails and, uh, it's almost like car sales, you know, it's like how good is an organization when they have eight teams at the same level, eight teams are all 16, 18, they're all same age. Like how good is that organization? How good is that team? So now you have your red, blue yellow turquoise pink teal well who's really magenta. getting the love too yeah like who you got you know now you're, you're absolutely you're favoring somebody you, yeah you have your elite team. Yeah. well yeah. now you have your other six teams that are pissed off that they're not on the elite team and dude it's a joke man i mean it really is uh so you know save your money go to junior college well even uh, that these kids that are going to division twos division II, nais for scholarships they have good grades. A lot of the yeah. JUCOs are like me. I was going to a junior college anyways, just grade wise. But now with the way high school is and everybody's graduating and being able to have good grades, you could be there for a year. You don't have to be a JUCO for two years. No, now if you have if the you're grades. a qualifier, you can transfer <clears> out. And, you know, you know, I speak just because I coach with Coach Purse, but, you know, that dude's got connections. That guy's a very well-respected coach. If he calls a guy and says, hey, uh, hooky. P here, uh, dude. I got a I got a freshman. This is a kid that you're probably gonna want to jump on. That that you're gonna want to get. He he's gonna be ready for you as a sophomore. Hooky's gonna come see that dude. You know, and it boils back down to skill level. Have have some. Be realistic about your skill level. Uh, you know, a lot of times I go watch pitchers and. You know, you, you talk to the dad and he's talking. Oh man, you know he's been throwing. He's up to up to ninety. Okay, well, that's not going to pitch in the SEC. Your son told me he wants to go to Alabama. That's not good enough for Alabama. So, you know, you got to reroute, be realistic. Hey, that might be more of Cal State Bakersfield or, uh, you know, a smaller school, maybe not of the SEC caliber. Set your sights for something that's attainable. Uh, and then don't be let down when, oh, man, I didn't get to go to Vanderbilt. Well, dude, you're throwing 84 miles an hour. You yeah, know, or go to a JUCO and develop one more year or two more years. Exactly. And, and, and then try to go there again. And if not, then those other schools are there. Give yourself that opportunity, man. Put yourself out there. Put yourself on a limb. See, but the problem with that is it boils down to them now. They don't want to put the work in because so, so many of these kids are so relied upon. Well, I'm part of this organization. Look at me. I'm a, I'm a 
so-so guy, or I don't want to say any names because then I get people all upset, but, you know, they think that they're good because of what they wear or what jersey they put on, man. That doesn't that doesn't entitle you to a scholarship because you you pay twelve hundred bucks a month to belong to this organization. That's not what it's about. Like you have to have the skill level, man. I mean, it just I, I it drives me crazy, man. You're in, you're out. Like I hear it day in, day out. Go to the park, and it's the same story. We heard one the other day. That, you know, my he he hasn't adjusted to the eighty mile an hour pitching yet. Look, dude, your son's a hitter, man. All I know is hitters hit. I don't care if it's 88, 78, 58, 38, 98. If a dude can hit, he's going to hit. It's not this. That's just making an excuse. Those dudes I run from, like those guys scared me to death. People that promise me things and people that make excuses like that I run from. Like, you know, don't promise me anything. You know, back in the day when I signed out agent, promise me I'll have you in double A. You signed with me. I, I promise. I guarantee you'll be in double A next year. So I just flipped it on him. I said, well, what if I go out and I hit a buck 80? It got dead silent. Oh, well, while I still not being, well, I still be in double A. Well, well, you know, you're going to have to. Okay, so don't guarantee me nothing because you can't promise me that. Like run from people that do that. Kids, if people promise you things that guarantee you that run, like get away, go away. Nobody can guarantee you that. Oh, I promise you, you'll this. Well, that guy's probably lying to you. So just be careful, like tread lightly. Um, but it's an epidemic, dude. We're, we're dealing in a funky era of baseball. I mean, God, I just can't get off it. But I heard there's a name of a facility called Hit a Bomb. Yeah, we're teaching hitters, dude. This ain't a Around slug. here? Yeah. Hit no, a bomb. it's up north, right? No, I think it's local. I think it's, I don't, I've never oh, I've heard it. it's called Hit a Bomb. Okay. Like, yeah, what is gonna that teach, guy They're going to teach you how to hit, that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, I'm going to learn how to hit that pitch down and away. That pitcher's pitch. I'm going to learn how to hit that one, you know. Uh I don't know. They're just working on what Bates all says, F8s. You know what? Bates, like I tell people this all the time, like the best hitting lesson you're going to get in town, you got to have a scholarship to get. Like, and it's right there at, at, at Biden. Um, he, he's, dude, he, he is really good at what he does when it comes to when guys get in the box and, and making his, his changes and tweaks with them. Um, and, and you look at what guys do that buy in. I mean, year in, year out. Like, guys scuffle as freshmen. It take them a little bit. Some guys adapt early. He has had those freshmen come in that, that step in and, and they're advanced. But you look at some of these other dudes, they scuffle their freshman and sophomore years, and then all of a sudden, you know, Tim John's starting to figure it out. Fresno is lighting it up. Fresno's got, like, that silly juice, you know. Yeah. Um, so does Tim John, you know, both of them. Mm. And and that's the thing about Bates, man. It's it's such a process, and he's about sticking to the process, trusting the plan, and, 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 and having you know trust in what you do not just like you know you you got to be a confident dude with with to play for Bates and you know I you know a lot of local kids want to go for him uh go there and play and they should uh but they need to know they got to be tough man yeah Bates is Bates is a dude that hey man he's gonna hold you to high standard like if you're not cutting it he's gonna let you know uh there's no sugar coat um and and you know I respect that like we need more coaches like that we need more guys to well, tell it's, it it's I mean, he's put some dudes out in the big leagues. I mean, it works. Yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, it's the right recipe. You know, and it, and and that's probably what scouts see is he's preparing them for pro ball. You know, we look at you it. you got to be tough. Look at, you know, you could probably you pull up a computer, you look, and you look at Fresno State, Nevada, in our area, Northern California, big leaguers come from, not to say they don't come from Stanford because they've had their plenty of big leaguers, but, man, you look at Fresno State, Nevada, Fresno State and Nevada spit out a lot of big leaguers. Cal, a lot of big leaguers. Like, dude, there's a reason those guys come down to Biden and watch, man. And and that goes back before Coach Bennett, uh, before Coach Batesel was there with Coach Bennett. I mean, dude, Weaver, Petty John, you know, he always had an arm. They always had players, you know. Um, and in Fresno, you talk to older scouts, and they love coming to Fresno. Uh, Gary Hughes was a guy I got to sit with at the draft this past June. And dude, you want to talk about a local, like just a, not just a local, that dude is a national legend. That guy signed John Elway. I mean, I don't, I can't even name all the big leaguers that guy signed. That guy's like Babe Ruth of scouting. Um, and, and you know, that dude talks about Fresno. Like, it's one of the most special places in the world. He loves coming to Fresno. Loved the Silver Dollar. Used to stay with, with the owner of the Silver Dollar. And um, Gary Hughes, I mean, that dude, like I said, man, that guy's like the Babe Ruth of scouting. And, um, you know, going to talk about that draft. But sitting there with that guy. 
you know, people are walking by Charles Johnson. He was the scouting director that drafted Charles Johnson. Hey, Charles, what's going on? How's your mother? You know, he sees Randy Johnson. He's shaking Randy's hand. And, and these players are, they have the utmost respect for this dude. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be sitting next to this guy. And um, that's one, like, thing about uh, baseball that is so special, dude. You just, you never know where you're cry. You never know what what, what path you're going to cross or, or who you might see that day. Um, you know, dude, I'm, I'm sitting on this bus with the Hall of Famers, dude. Um, sitting at a table eating lunch, Brian Roberts. I got Lee Smith down at the end of the table. Uh, you know, it, it's, you know, he's holding court down there telling, you know, stories and stuff. And, um, it's just, it, it was one of the most amazing like experiences and, and, and it's all because of a little white baseball with red seams, man. I, I've, I've gotten to go to Canada. I played in Canada, uh, when I was in, when I was in junior college, I got to go up there and play in the SMBL. Dude, that was like the greatest thing ever. And then I played in Culiacan, Mexico, uh, one winter. Um, I've been all over. I've been to probably 45, 40, I mean, I don't know the exact number of states, but it's in the mid forties, you know, across the country. Uh, I've been everywhere, dude. I'll be all chasing a little white baseball, man. Um, it's, it's a massive like fraternity that, that you build and you grow and, um, it, it's, and it's a special one to be a part of, dude, you know, uh, especially, you know, being able to say I, I was fortunate enough to get to play in the big leagues too. I mean, there aren't there are only what 17,000 ever, uh, granted it was a really shitty little run that I put up up there, but you know, I had a uni and, um, I got to play for Frank Robinson and dude, baseball is an amazing, amazing, amazing sport. Uh, you know, and you talk to like guys like coach purse about it and it, it, dude, it teaches you more about life than any other sport. Um, and, and learning from a guy like coach Bennett and, and being around, uh, those kind of baseball people, it, it dude, it, it's really, you just can't put it into words. Like the amount of respect, not only respect you have for, for the game, but for the people that, that, that taught you to, to love a game that you love the, the way I do. Um, you know, and I know you, you guys do too. And dude, this is one of the greatest things this Valley has is this hit or die. I mean, this is awesome. You guys are branching out. You're getting down. You're talking to Long Beach State. You're talking to Coach Esker up at, up at, up at, uh, Stanford, um, Hookie, Savage. I mean, dude, this is great. People need to hear this kind of stuff. They need to hear guys that have been around and, and played a little bit that have some experience and, and the, the local coaches you're having on, man. I mean, dude, it, it's every week. It's, it's another great guy that gets to sit on this couch and, uh, you know, this is really good. So thanks guys. And for having me, Yeah, man. you know, heading up, uh, North today. Yeah. I'm a boogie up to, uh, you know, Manteca and, and watch this, this catcher that I had, um, playing my little fall underclass. Like, um, I did a little, you know, I, I try to, I want to be like the old school guys. Like I got into scouting because of a guy named Bert Holt. Um, Bert Holt was the first scout that ever, uh, paid attention to me. Um, I went to his workout at Exeter High School at the old little Lions ballpark when I was a sophomore. And we ran 60s and we threw across the diamond. And I just always remember him telling me, you know what, boy? We got to get you on the right side of the table, the one where the meat and potatoes are, because we got to put a little meat on those bones. So, he, you know, <laughs> I just always remember him. And he always had these little one liners. You know, you'd be out there, it'd be smoking hot, man. I remember being at the Fresno State camp and he'd come walking by and like you know what lampy every day at the ballpark's like christmas morning and you're like dude it's like 107 what are you talking about bert you know just upbeat had these kangaroo skin leather shoes that you know i i look back and i wanted to be like bert like i i wanted his i wanted to have a job like that someday i thought that was a you know god i'm doing it now but you look back it's like dude this could be that could be the greatest job ever dude I, I drive around i get to talk to baseball players i watch baseball and then i i try to figure out who can play in the big leagues you know and i, and I was always just um I, I just had so much respect for coach holton and, and what he did and 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 the amount of ground that guy saw every high school he made it a point to see every high school in his area um and and i found that out through other scouts you know now that i've done that and guys that that were around towards the latter part of his scouting days and um, you know, that was one thing they had. Everybody had so much respect for that man and, and how he did his job and how he handled himself as a complete professional uh, day in, day out. And uh, I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be like Bert, you know, and, and have camps where I invited local kids that um, never had that opportunity, um, you know. And, and so I started doing this little thing this past fall. And, I, you know, I was fortunate. I, was, I had about 39 kids. Uh, so I was able to separate it up into three teams. 
Um, and we do about an hour of fundamental work. Um, you know, I was lucky I had some other scouts that showed up. Brandon Simon came out, did some stuff with the outfielders, uh, had a couple other area scouts that, that wanted to pop in and, and uh, get involved um, and instruct. So um, it, it's just an awesome opportunity. It, it's a great opportunity, I think, for the kids um, to get around other good players. I, I think that when you're around other good players, it makes you – it makes you like, dude. It makes you, it puts you on point, dude. You, you you can't get sloppy. No, you, you can't be a clown. It pushes you a little bit more. Yeah, you can't be a clown. It, it makes you. It holds you up to That's a little. That's what higher competing standard. is, right? Hundred percent, dude. It'll humble um, you. You know, so you get these dudes around them, and and you try to start, man. My job is, yeah, it's about scouting the tools, dude. But it's about figuring out these kids, man. Which kid wants it the most? You know, and when you get in those kind of environments, I mean, certain kids separate themselves. Uh, I think Noah Bill happens to be one of those kids. I like Noah. You know, I'll say it on air, whatever. I like Noah. Uh, I think Noah has a good and, – and Noah did a lot in those little those little workouts off a of slider machine and, and, you know, better velocity that, hey, man, I kind of like this dude. There's something to this kid. And you get to know him. You start talking to the kid. kind of like the kid. Um, but, you know, it, it's just an opera – like I said, man, it's just a good chance for me to uh, get to know these kids at a different level. You going to do it again this fall? I'd love to do it again this fall. Um, I, I'd like to do another underclass. I had an underclass workout. I think it's important as an area guy, you know, it's not only knowing about the dudes you have coming this year, uh, but you got to be able to put some pins on the map to, to locate some guys down the road to have, you know, build my prep list. So it's not like trying to like go out and find a hundred dudes at once. You know, you so slowly grab a couple kids from this workout. You know, if I get up to Sacramento, I do a workout up there. I can grab five or six more follows. You know, I do one up in Santa Rosa, you know, now it's all of a sudden, now I got a pretty good grasp for what the baseball is coming to me. Then the year's coming. Uh, and I'm getting to know these kids, man. So the first time I talked to them, isn't their senior year. Cause I just watched them. They go, hey, dude, I remember yeah, I came to your workout two years ago, man. How you doing? Hey, nice to see you again. Hey, you know, it already, we've already gotten yeah, past the handshake. There. Yeah, some familiarity. And it's going to know these dudes and creating relationships, man, and building history. Um, Is it going to be invite only? Or, I mean, we can obviously help you get it out there. And- dude, I would love to have, you know, I, I'd like to invite as many kids as I can. Um, but I, I, I try to kind of like hand select it and, and, and base it off of uh, just what, players that i've seen and, and it is underclassmen underclass i mean i have kids like this past this past fall i did have you know guys that were seniors um and i'd like to continue that which the majority of the roster was seniors um but dude i had a i had a really solid core underclass and i think if i can just keep grabbing those three four freshmen all of a sudden those three four freshmen it turns into 10 12 sophomores and and you know who honestly are some of the best recruiters dude kids the kids man yeah. the kids For i'll me. say hey dude you know, Eddie Saldivar happens to be one of these good little players. He's going to Long Beach State. So, Eddie, who am I missing, man? And he'll drop a name. Or Corbin Ibarra is another young kid. Hey, Corb, who, who, who do you think I'm missing? Or Timo. And they'll always say, you know, they'll tell you. Because those kids have respect for those other players that they think are good. And, um, you know, you, you got to keep that in mind. You know, we ask these kids, hey, you know, like if I was, you know, going to scout Roth, I'd say, hey, Roth, who's the best pitcher you face, dude? Underwood. Underwood. Okay, why? Tell me about it. Because he's all three pitches for strikes. Okay, throws well, curveball in every once. Walk me through one of one of your bats with him. Uh, first bat, I remember this. <laughs> see, no, see, but you you even saying that right there, boom! It already kind of lights up a little light for me because yeah. now you have recall, dude. Yeah, you know. So go ahead, carry on. I know you want to tell him. Let's go. No, it was first bat. I remember yeah. uh, it was a one one count, and I took a fastball over the scoreboard here in Madeira. And then my second at bat was bam, bam, bam. Okay. <laughs> That's Just what happens, three dude. hammers, man. That's what happens. And I, uh, I've only gotten one other hit off of in my entire career. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we were in pro ball back nope. at City. See it? <laughs> like, those are the kind of things like you, you want to hear from kids, man. You, you start asking them, hey, dude, who uh, who's the toughest arm you faced? And a guy will drop a name. One year it happened to be Matt Manning and Obviously, we don't know. everybody know why Matt Manning, Matt Manning, and and this this upcoming season because he'll be up there with Detroit. But you know, you talk to these dudes like, dude, that guy's fastball. <laughs> I couldn't see it, and then you, and you watch the game, and these kids are just telling you everything that you're watching. You know, and they'd say it sometimes in different verbiage and their little youthful uh, lines. But man, these kids are, you know. At the end of the day, you, I get to I get to go out and give a kid, you know, an opportunity to chase his dream, dude. You know, somebody gave it to me back in the day, and uh, 
you know, it took five opportunities to get it. And some guys, that's just some guys, man, you know, dude, if I could have signed out of high school, I would have God, I would have loved it, but I would have been home in a year. You know, everybody's timing's different. You know, you can't, you can't force it. You can't force your hand at pro ball. Cause if you do, dude, you're going to be home washing cars, man, or back in school. You know, everybody's time is different, man. Um, you know, and, and to being able to be in a position where I can say, Hey dude, I want to take this kid, you know, like Carson, uh, that one really excited me, uh, just cause I'd known him for a long time as a young kid. And I knew he wanted to play pro ball. There was no questions. He wanted to play. And that's, that's the most important thing is you can't, can't dude, if a kid doesn't want to play, man, he's not going to last. He'll be home. He'll be home. And then I got to go look at his mom and dad, you know, and, Dude, I don't want to explain to his mom and dad. We had to release a kid, kid that could be a junior in college. Now that's a hard conversation to have, you know, because um, once they get in a, one, you know, Carson's out and hey, I did my job, you know, Carson's. It's up to Carson and player development now to get Carson to where Carson wants to get, uh, and and the balls in his court. It's going to boil down to how much you know time he's going to put in, how many ground balls he's going to take, how many hours he's going to spend in the weight room. Uh, you know, he's got a great. He's got a good dad that, that, that showed him, you know, a lot along the way and is going to keep keep guiding him the right direction. He's just got to, you know, put his nose to the grindstone and, and focus on that light at the end of the tunnel, man, because sometimes it looks like it's a long ways away. But, dude, you can get there really fast sometimes, man, really fast. So, uh, Well, I know you got to get out of here. Yeah, unfortunately, I, do. I could sit here and talk baseball with you guys all day long. This is what we typically do. Well, we phone. promise you and guarantee you, you will be on the show again. No, yeah. you did. That was great, man. <laughs> no, I know you did. I was honestly, man. I'm like, I was really pumped up. Like I said, dude. Like what you guys are doing. This is this is awesome. Um, I I think a lot of people, you know, having the opportunity to hear guys like Coach Person and, and you guys. You guys had two episodes with Coach Bennett, man. I mean, how many guys get to sit around with that dude and talk about all the baseball stuff that guys that guys lived through and, and, and been firsthand and the players he's coached and all the dudes around the valley that have baseball ties to coach Bennett and Fresno state and, and coach Biden. And, um, that's what, that is truly what makes our area very special. Um, and it's not just me saying that cause I live here. This is people from all outside the area. These are dudes that when I scout with, they always tell me Lavi dude, I love coming to Fresno. We love coming to scout these games. This is the best place to watch baseball. And guys say that on a daily basis to me. And it just, you know, you look at our communities, it just speaks volumes of, of the, the, the coaches, man. You know, it, it, at the end of the day, it boils down to these coaches, dude. If, if all these high school coaches in this area didn't put the hours and, and, and passion that they have in their programs, it wouldn't be like this, man. It's not like this in any other area that I go to. I, I can assure you that. Uh, there might be some better players. Hey, man, I'll tell you that straight up. Sorry to break everybody's heart. There are some better players. Um, but there aren't better coaches, dude, or, or a better uh, format for how things are supposed to be done and, and done professionally. You know, the track you guys are taking BP before games, dude, it doesn't get any better than that. You got, on, you know, Tuesday, Thursday nights under the lights. Um, this area is special, man, and, and and I'm just happy to be a part of it and, and live in it and going to get to experience and get to go to watch my kid go through the Clovis schools and watch them play and um, it, but it truly is, man. When you when you look at it from outside looking in, everybody loves coming to Fresno. They well, love it. I know. I appreciate it. We, you know, you kind of helped us out getting Esker and Eager on here, and uh, we appreciate that. That was a lot of fun. Those guys are next level dudes, man. Uh, their stories are great too. Hundred um, percent. And we haven't really I mean, talked to them. They're like, yeah, who who can we help you get? You know, they invite us to practices, and same with Savage. And it was uh, it's been a lot of fun so far. So. That's what's nice about, like, true baseball guys, man. Like, true baseball guys. And you can tell a baseball guy within the first five minutes you meet him. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like, this is a baseball dude. Because that's how they are, man. They're, they're open. They, they want to learn. Like, Well, my- you, you said something about purse, right? Uh, you know, about his connections. And, you know, we're not playing, right? So we just did the podcast. And, Chad, how quickly did that turn around with Savage and Van Hook? On the way home in three days. Yeah, that's hooky or that—that's Coach P, man. Like, so 
Coach P, listen, if Coach P Plus he believes something, in something. Yes, that's what I was just going to get into. He's like he's like Shaq, you know, you only see Shaq doing commercials or something that he really <laughs> believes in. <laughs> Coach P's like Shaq, dude. Like, he's not going to go promote something unless he's, he's down for it and he believes and he thinks that they're the guy that, I mean, you guys are doing it. There's no non, you guys aren't biased. It's not like you guys sit here and preach one thing and you guys are all up for it. Like, it's open discussion. You talk and it's opinions. And, and, and I mean, that's all you can ask for in, in, in honesty, dude. Like, people don't like honesty. Honesty, but honesty at the end of the day is the best there's thing. Some people man. need to hear it. Yeah, and just, you know, dude, if there's one thing people can, you know, just take, just be realistic, man, of what level you 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 think you know you're ready for and, and ready to play at, and um, be realistic with it, man. Otherwise, you're going to be let down, and and you know, just be prepared, work hard, do what you do, and and things happen for a certain reason, man. Uh, you can't force yourself anywhere, so. Just be realistic about it and put them hours in. Yeah. If you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm working harder today than I did yesterday or anybody else, then you're probably on the right right path. Yeah. It's, I, dude, I tell the kids every time, man, when I do a workout, something, it's like, you, you, man, you're not just competing against the dudes right here in the Valley. You know, you're competing against, you know, you guys trying to get scholarships. It's a nation nationwide competition. <laughs> and if you want to play at the level that I'd like to send some of you to, man, it's a worldwide competition now. Um, so you got to get outside and, and, and understand and know that, man, dude, this ain't going to, first off, it's not going to be an easy process. It's going to take some time. It's going to take a lot of hard work. Uh, and most importantly, man, like you gotta be lucky, dude. All it takes is one day guy comes in and sees you, man. Uh, all it takes is one day guy roll in to see you and next thing you know, you got a scholarship or, or somebody's trying to offer you a little bit of money to go chase your dream, you know? Uh, just just be ready for that opportunity uh prepare yourself for that opportunity i mean that's all you can really tell these dudes um but i look forward to seeing you guys on the diamond coaching i'm sure they'll i'm sure there'll be some heated battles coming up uh, as we get into this track play i think it's going to kind of be a bloodbath uh, yeah. this year i don't necessarily Definitely know gonna be some run away with scoring it. games i think a lot of arms yeah lot man, of arms. i mean Gosh, you look at, you know, and you get down to Bakersfield. Bakersfield's a friend. You know, Frontier's got two quality arms. That little mm-hmm. angling kid, I saw him pitch on Friday. He can he can spin the baseball. He's got a little 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 hair on the fastball. And then the Hoffy kid, I didn't get to see him, but yeah, I he know threw, he's got a pretty good little I actually arm. liked uh, how he threw a slider. A lot of 2 0, 3 0. Like he had good command of it. Uh, feel. Had a little fuzz. He was upper, upper, mid to upper. Yeah, he's a kid um, that came to work out. Yeah. But uh, a lot of upside. No, we'll good. be seeing you around here, Easter Classic, too. That, and that's another great tournament, man. I mean, we've got the Boris going on, and, and there's another tournament up in St. Francis, Francis area. But, um, I mean, you can plan on – dude, you're going to see a lot of scouts down here. Pappy did a good job this year. They've got some good teams in. and uh, they're, Not to mention good teams, but, I mean, you're going to see a lot of pro guys running around. There's a lot of prospects, dude. Uh, you know, Oakmont's coming down. They'll have that kid. He might be on there throwing 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Pappy. Uh, you did it. You did a great job. <laughs> is he watching live or he, something? No, no, no but, but he, he'll uh, get it. <laughs> he'll he get will. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, dude. He, they all do a fantastic job. Pop, yeah. dude, this dinner's classic. I mean, it's going to be. Uh, it'll be a little di- bit different without Sam and, yeah. and Sam's jokes. Uh, and Sam's jokes were always and classic James. because he's busting Pappy's balls. And yep. God, if anybody needs his balls busted, it's Pappy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> That's Dude, I love that guy, man. We love <laughs> busting his balls. He's, he's, he's and James. Fun. James wow, always. Pat, James was good for uh, Coach J- P. James Patch was always good I'm for. I'm sure Coach P is going to make a comment. He's going to make a celebrity appearance. I hope know? so. I miss um, that guy. Don't get me started talking about him too, because man, you talk about legendary coaches, dude. Okay, just real quick before I get out of here. <laughs> but if people want to put that man's coaching career, you know, nobody that dude. When you say legend, that's capital letters. All yeah. the way across. Yeah. You know, coach, what, 32, 33 seasons? 32. 32 seasons. Okay. You get a plaque. You get a plaque for winning, winning the Valley or runner up. Okay. That little shed right behind first base dugout has 15 plaques. You know, you start doing the math. That guy is playing for a title every other year, you know, and then he's winning one every fourth year. You know, that's, that's a program. <laughs> That that's that's winning, and that's reg- dude. That guy was winning with whether he had five Division One commits, a pro prospect, or he was winning Absolutely. with not a single Division One player. That is, man, to what he did. Like you know, like I have a lot of respect for Coach Patrick, and and I'm not the only one. I mean, just statewide, what that dude is, did during his career. 
uh, on the baseball diamond with those players is, I mean, dude, that's a, that's legend, man. I've, true legend. I haven't met a person that knows him. I haven't met anybody that's not enjoyed being around him either. No, man. And does not like that guy. And if you have the opportunity to get to coach with that guy, he is special on the diamond, man. He's out there doing drills with the players and he's interacting. And I mean, his energy level can meet and match and, and, and peak his players. I mean, and that's what makes him so special is that the, the man just has passion for kids and, and watching kids. One of his get players better. wanted to win for him. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that's when you know you're, you, dude, that's when you're a legend. When you, when your players do just like mesmerize and do, we've got to win for code, you know, and uh, Coach P, man, like, legend dude i'll keep saying it but that's what he does uh and he did for years and kudos man hat off to that yeah, guy enjoy the retirement no doubt well dude i appreciate you believe it i some do time. need to yeah, yeah he's gotta go you gotta get Good me games to watch before but, uh, the ballpark we'll be doing another update this week and uh that's episode uh 42 42 josh labandera boom hit or die You can get the Hit or Die podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Spreaker, and iHeartRadio. The show is also available on YouTube. For news and updates about the show or to get involved, check us out on Facebook and Twitter at Hit or Die Podcast.